Most likely, if you look around you right now, if you're outside or you can see out a window, most of the plants, at least by the numbers that you see, numbers of species, would be angiosperms in the flowering plants. Here living on the west coast, we have a lot of conifers, a lot of gymnosperm diversity, but they're still outnumbered by the angiosperms, which have over 300,000 species. When you compare that to groups like gymnosperms, who only have maybe a thousand extant species, or our ferns, which are maybe at 20,000, bryophytes again, somewhere around 20,000. Um, I might have mixed those numbers up, one of them might be lower. But by and large, angiosperms are our largest group. And their whole philosophy um, as an evolutionary strategy is to work smarter, not harder. For these lectures, we're going to look at our additions to the big phylogeny. And these will be the last ones that you need to know. And with those additions, we will be looking at the characteristics of angiosperms. How do we classify something as an angiosperm? Characteristics that unite all angiosperms. All angiosperms will produce flowers. They won't necessarily look like what we think of as a flower, but they will make a flower structure. They might be highly reduced like in the grasses and you just have these big uh, pollen producing structures that you have hanging out there in the wind um, or maybe some feathery pollen collecting structures. But the whole idea is that you have a specialized um, structure, I'm going to use that word a bunch of times I guess, to um, both deliver and receive pollen. Sometimes that'll be um, within the same structure flower um, and sometimes it'll be different. All flowers turn into fruits. So anytime you see um, most of the plants around you, at some point in the year, they're gonna make a flowering structure where they're gonna produce pollen or receive pollen or both. And then that fl flowering structure, once it gets fertilized, will have seeds that develop and those seeds will develop inside a protective coating. That protective coating is the ovary protective, protective. And not only is it protective, but it can also be specialized to aid in dispersal. So depending on how you would like your seeds to get out there in the world, um, you can evolve <laughs> accidentally over uh, the course of uh, many selective events to have a different type of fruit that will have a different dispersal mechanism. So flowers are for reproduction. And that's pollen dispersal or re is receival a word <laughs> who knows you know when people are potentially watching you do something it becomes hard to think like a real human being okay so we have flowers we have fruits what else do we have we have this weird process called double fertilization So when we had gymnosperms, they had two sperm that would um, go fertilize one of the eggs in an archegonium. And only one of those would get fertilized and grow to become the embryo within the seed. In double fertilization, we have those two sperm and each of them is going to fertilize something within the same ovule. One will fertilize an egg and the other one is going to fertilize uh, the polar nuclei or the central cell, which is already diploid. So then it becomes triploid. So that's going to result in this sort of extra food source for the growing embryo. And you can think of uh, popcorn. When you pop popcorn and eat that, that fluffy part of the popcorn is that inflated endosperm. Um, so it's this nutritive source of calories. So we get double fertilization. We also get further reduction of the gametangia, so, or reduced gametophytes. Gametangia slash gametophytes.
And in this, we have a loss of archegonia. So we no longer have those. In the gymnosperms, we lost the antheridia. In the angiosperms, we lose archegonia. And the pollen now is two-celled. So there's no more prothallial cells. Those were vestigial anyway, so didn't need them. The other big thing we will have is complex vascular tissue. And this is going to be the vascular tissue that you're used to seeing because when we started the class with anatomy, we were covering these cells. So we have vessel elements. in the xylem and we have sieve tube elements and companion cells in the phloem and all of these structures allow Besides maybe this reduction of our gametophytes, that just goes on our general trend of um, land plants evolving is that we've reduced the gametophytes slowly over time. All of the rest of these allow angiosperms to be excellent competitors with all of the other plants that already exist. We have very few records of early angiosperms. The evolution of angiosperms is still a bit of a mystery. We don't know what the first ones look like because they evolved in these very full worlds. Um, and it's likely that those early angiosperms would have evolved maybe in like a dark, wet forest, um, which would have been populated by gymnosperms. And that's a terrible place to be preserved as a fossil because you're not going to be, you know, in a, um, a big lake or a pond or something where sediment is going to accumulate and you can get buried in it. Um, so we don't have good records of those early angiosperms, but all of these traits are um, allowing them to compete with this massive proliferation of plants that's already on the planet. So here is a review slide of those characteristics if you need to pause it and go over them. We can add all of those traits to the big phylogeny. So this just ends with angiosperms, which are one monophyletic group, much like the gymnosperms. spell that wrong the first time. Ginkgos. Okay, so those are our gymnosperms. They are a sister group to the angiosperms. And our big separating things here are flowers, fruits, double fertilization, loss of archegonia vessel elements sieve tube elements and companion cells Now these here, I should say it's right there, vessel elements, double fertilization, and fruit and flower-like structures evolved convergently in neophytes. So these are the reasons why we thought that the neophytes were maybe a sister group to the angiosperms. However, it's all convergent. So their vessel elements, their method of double fertilization, and these fruit and flower-like structures that they make are all just 
suited to their particular situation in the same way that it was for the angiosperm. So the environment selected for those traits um, in both groups separately. And we'll see that a lot within angiosperms, many examples of convergent evolution because there was strong selective pressure on all of these um, groups as they evolved. 